started. Are you all ready to roll? All Absolutely. Right. Let's get this party started. Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are so glad you are here with us. And just by showing up, you are already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I am pleased to feature two rock stars from across the pond in London. And both of these gentlemen represent precisely what I aim to deliver in each one of these sessions. Two really accomplished music executives that perhaps our audience may not be that familiar with. And I promise you will leave today smarter and more inspired than you arrived. More on that in just a moment. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends, and please make some new ones. And ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those along the way as possible. And please make sure your chat is set to address speakers and attendees. It will say everyone. I'd like to thank our program sponsors for without their support, we couldn't keep this series free. Special thanks to First Horizon Bank, Turnkey ZRG, Four Roses Bourbon, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmasters. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome back my good friend and music industry's international ambassador of goodwill, Ralph Simon. Ralph has enjoyed a 30 plus year career in a variety of prominent fields. First, as a music industry visionary who co-founded major indie leader Zamba and Jive Records. He has signed talent, grew a globally successful music publishing company, managed some of the world's top recording producers, was EVP at Capitol Records and Blue Note, and foresaw the potential of mobile phones and social media very early on. He is one of the founders of the global mobile entertainment and mobile social media industry and popularly known as the father of the ringtone. Ralph correctly predicted that the future belongs to screenagers everywhere who will run their social media lives, music, streaming, and connecting on their mobile phones. He's currently developing an exciting new music series for TV and social media called The Virtuosos. He's founder and CEO of Mobilium Global, Based in London, Ralph maintains long-standing links to the USA and the rest of the world. He's a fellow at the Royal Society of Arts and in the UK and a member of the Recording Academy in the USA. Welcome back, Ralph. So glad to have you with us again. Thank you, Tom. Great to be back on Smartest People in the Room. You are the smartest person in the room by putting all of this together. And tonight, today, tonight here, today in uh, the United States is really special. It sure is. I can't wait. Let me tell you a little bit about who's sitting next to you there. And joining Ralph as today's featured guest is Jeff Taylor. Jeff is chief executive of the BPI, the Representative Trade Association for UK independent and major label, major record labels, and of the Brit Awards Limited, with each year stages the Brit Awards. Jeff is also responsible for the annual Mercury Prize as its CEO. Jeff is also a director of the official charts company, a governor of both the Brit School for the Performing Arts and Technology in Croydon and of East London Arts and Music, the Industry Academy and a trustee of the BPI and Brit's charitable arm, the Brit Trust, which supports charities that promote education and well-being throughout through music. Jeff is a passionate advocate for the protection and promotion of intellectual property within music and across the wider creative arts. And in support of this, he chairs the Creative Industries Council IP group. Before joining the BPI as its chief executive in 2007, Jeff was general counsel and executive vice president at the Global Record Industry Association, IFPI, having also been general counsel at the BPI during an earlier spell with the organization. 
He practiced EU and competition law at the U.S. law firm Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. It has an honors degree in law and French from Sussex University and a postgraduate diploma in EU law from College of Europe in Bruges. Jeff is a lifetime music fan who attended a music school from the age of seven and ran a recording studio during his time at university, but eventually confronted the reality that in a reverse of industry norms, he was gonna to have to pay people to listen to his music. <laughs> He's now committed to making sure that many talented people drawn from all backgrounds who work in music have a chance to succeed and see their creative potential realized by creating an environment in which artists and record labels that support them can thrive. Please welcome these two rock stars to the smartest people in the room. Take it away, Ralph. Thank you very much, Tom. Jeff, what a great, great treat to have you here and uh, the smartest people in, in the room, smartest person in the room, and you certainly are that, and just so great that you've made time in uh, the UK, cold, cold, winter um, UK, and uh, welcome, Jeff. Great to have you with us. We, we don't see Jeff. Uh, we'll, we'll pick up uh, Jeff in just a second. We're having a little bit of difficulty with our feed, but um, just to give you some kind of idea, um, the BPI um, uh, has been around uh, in 2023, it'll, it will celebrate its 50th anniversary. And uh, in any event, for around 60 years now, the US has been the most important export market for British labels and artists and British music. And uh, the USA regularly accounts for more than a third of UK label exports. And uh, in fact, in 2019 and 2020, 40% of British exports went to the US. So um, certainly in, for example, 2015 to 2020, the US market generated ooh, almost $2, $2 billion for UK labels. And um, this is something that continues all the time. In fact, uh, there's always been a tremendous uh, uh, presence by British talent in America. Of course, Americans love British music, British musicians and labels and executives love America. And so um, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, Tom, let's see if we can get um, Jeff back uh, in the frame. Well, we can't hear you, Tom. Just unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I always oh, mute myself. Uh, Ralph, I'm afraid we've lost him for the moment. So here he comes back in right now. Right. Um, one moment, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> well, um, let's just see how we can get him back. And um, I'm glad to see that we've got um, some good friends that um, are, are here in the chat. And um, I was glad to see Howie Singer, the great Howie Singer, someone who was really one of the great pioneers of music technology. Howie, welcome. Great to see you um, here in, uh, in the room. And also, too, uh, we've got uh, Nikki Skeen, who's a uh, uh, former Global TEDx ambassador. He's calling in from Vienna in Austria. So uh, we also have Shelley Katz. Hi, Shelley. The famous and wonderful John Ruby, uh, who was responsible for shooting all of the um, uh, film and video for Live 8, the great, great event that helped to uh, eliminate poverty. So John Ruby from California. Welcome, John. Great to see you here. We've got Morten Dahlgren from Malmö in Sweden. We've got uh, the great artist, Michelle Schock. Michelle, welcome. Great to see you here. Dawn Posey's with us. Uh, Brody Dawson. Hi, Brody. Brody's a regular to this session. Uh, Gabriel Wamba. Uh, Gabriel, nice to see you here from the Netherlands. We found it. Goed om jou te zien. Jerry Limbo, welcome. You here with us. Shelley Katz. Um, so uh, we've got a good bunch of people and we've got uh, people joining in and um, coming to join us uh, all along the way here. We've got um, lots of really interesting stuff to talk about because um, there is a whole new generation of British talent. Ah, I think Jeff is, um, we almost have him. Uh, there's a, oh, there we are, Jeff, welcome back. Did you go to the pub to get a pub? I'm so sorry, everybody. I like British technology just does not work basically. Uh, that was a terrible start. Sorry, guys. No, no problem. Where had you got up to? 
to Ralph. Well, Jeff, first of all, a, a warm welcome. Um, we were just uh, taught, telling the audience the fact that in 2023, it'll be the 50th anniversary of the BPI. But um, I think uh, with yourself, um, as Tom had said, you were dyed in the wool involved in music. You actually were in a choir. And one of your earliest achievements was actually doing backing vocals for a Paul McCartney session at Abbey Road Studios. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I, well, I was saying to Tom earlier, this is, this is something that I've managed to avoid talking about through my entire music industry career because I find it so embarrassing. But I've now reached the point at which, you know, I'm beyond embarrassment for what happens to you at my age. So um, last night, actually, I was back at Abbey Road uh, for an event that Universal put on. And we were sitting in Studio Two, and it kind of brought it all back. Um, when I was a kid, yeah, I was in the St. Paul's Cathedral Choir, um, you know, singing classical music every day. And occasionally our choir master would take us off to do, you know, recordings and backing tracks and things like that. So one day we all tripped up at, at Abbey Road, and there was, you know, then just Paul McCartney before he was Sir Paul and George Martin, and we were in together. Uh, or, or as it's more popularly known, uh, the Frog Chorus. And then there I was, a little frog on a, on a Paul McCartney record, uh, generally considered to be his, not his finest work. Uh, I think it got somewhere in the top 10, uh, but maybe it gave me the bug for, for being in a recording studio and, and working in, in the music industry. So, uh, Jeff, just to give people a little bit of background about yourself, uh, you went and studied law, but then you joined the um, the BPI early on and then left to join the IFPI, where you were an executive director at the IFPI, the global body for the global, global music industry, industry that assembled everybody to look at the way that music could be developed uh, 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 and, the, and the finances that come from it. And then in 2007, you rejoined uh, the BPI and you've effectively been the head of the BPI. Uh, for, for that period of time, 14 years, where you've seen uh, remarkable progress by British talent. And one of the things we wanted to explore in this particular session, Jeff, was um, there's been this constant fascination in America for British talent and, of course, incredible uh, success uh, in America. Just give us a little bit of your sense of uh, where things are today in terms of this love affair between America and Britain and with British talent? Well, you know, I'd be really interested to hear from, from some of the folks on the chat, you know, whether they think it really is a love affair for British talent or whether we just kept on managing to unearth talent that feels, you know, relevant to an American audience. I, I, I don't know whether it's something to do with their Britishness uh, that appeals to the American audience or whether it's just, you know, the music itself. Um, we have had an astonishing track record and you go back to the, you know, the British invasion in the 60s and obviously the Beatles and the Stones and Queen and, you know, the long uh, Pink Floyd and the sort of long uh, heritage that we have of British artists all the way to more recent years, I think with, you know, One Direction and Amy Winehouse and Adele and now Dua Lipa and Ed Sheeran, you know, we, we, we have had an incredible track record of, of breaking artists as global superstars and particularly breaking the US, which is always the key market. Uh, to make an impact in. Um, so, so now I think, if anything, it's getting a bit tougher. Uh, everyone's looking for the next artist who can go on to, you know, be, absolutely be a, a global superstar. And, and, you know, the competition is fiercer than ever. I think we're feeling it in our domestic market that, if anything, US acts are performing more strongly here in the UK, and that's more competition for our domestic artists. And on these global streaming platforms, you know, if you come from a small country like the UK, you're at a disadvantage because the algorithms are looking at play counts and a US artist at their development stage is gonna have a lot more plays than a typical UK artist just because of our population sizes. So, you know, it's, if anything, it's getting harder to break through. Uh, that, that seems to be the case, although there's a new generation of uh, fantastic British talent. I'll just mention the names of some of them, a band called the 1975, of course, Harry Styles. Well, we love the 1975. They're they're one of our like their label, Dirty Hit, is one of one of our most uh, progressive and active indie labels. And you know they, they work very closely with the majors too. But 
they're, they're, they're fantastic. I've got another artist called Biba Doobie who will also be coming your way. Oh, fantastic. I'm not familiar with them, but of course, Harry Styles had a big number one during the summer uh, in America with Watermelon Sugar, such a great song. Uh, Louis Capaldi had a top 10 hit with Before You Go in the same month as Harry Styles. And of course, Dua Lipa is quite interesting because she really broke through and now has got a number one hit with uh, Elton John. Well, exactly. I think it's Elton's, I think he's had a number one in the last, every decade, the last six decades. It's astonishing. Um, so, oh. you know, I, I was at an event last night with uh, Becky Allen from EMI uh, here. And she was talking about how even with artists of the stature of, of Sir Elton, you're still working as a label to help them develop and find new audiences and work with new artists. And, you know, he's amazing. And he, he's, he's the biggest champion of, of new British artists that we have. Uh, so it's great to see that success. So it's interesting. We've got someone uh, watching the session now, Jeff, by the name of Kevin Clager, who says the irony uh -huh. is all of those British acts mentioned were inspired by US R&B artists, obviously, certainly uh, the, the established catalog artists. But if I think of some of the big names that have come through in the last two years with Sam Smith, uh, Louis Tomlinson, uh, Glass Animals particularly have got a big top 20 hit with a song called Heat Waves. Heat Waves, it's huge. Huge, yeah, it's fantastic. And of course, um, this Christmas, I think, is going to be owned by Ed Sheeran and Adele. That's what the numbers... Well, yeah, I think our, you know, hopefully we'll get a bit of a boost in 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 market share in the US and worldwide with with the Ed and Adele album coming out. We're all waiting waiting for the Adele release, obviously. Uh, yeah. But you know, it should be a strong year this year, and I'm really pleased to see you know, a band like Glass Animals breaking through. Sometimes uh, there's another a band also on Universal called Easy Life, who are also it's, it's kind of a slower burn. They don't break through suddenly. It can take a year or two of development or longer for these artists to really break through into public consciousness. And, you know, British labels have to stay patient and keep on nurturing that talent over the long term. Well, one of the things I'd like you to, to, to talk about is that, um, in fact, uh, the indie segment is, is really very buoyant. Got some great indie labels that are born and born in Britain and developing internationally with big success. People talk about Beggar's Banquet, of course, but there's a whole new generation of indie labels. Give us a couple that uh, have uh, that have been doing well and and that the BPI is tracking well. Yeah, I'd say um, one I mentioned in particular is called Partisan Records. Um, that you guys may know, which I think is also quite active in the US, but uh, uh, developing a lot of talent in the UK. Uh, they've got a band called Idols, um, who are kind of punkish rock, rock bands, super high energy, uh, high impact, really fantastic uh, band. And then another, another band, an Irish band called Fontaine's DC, uh, who are also brilliant. Uh, check out the song called The Boys in the Better Land, which is fantastic, which you must listen to. Um, so they're terrific. But when you look at Partisan, Dirty Hit that I mentioned, kind of marathon artists, Good Soldier, you know, there are lots of artists, lots of British labels that are really working hard to bring through new talent. And that's where future success will come from. And uh, Jeff, a lot of people have said that rap in America didn't really travel to other countries. And of course, there's now a burgeoning rap scene in the UK. Give us a couple of the names of the emerging British rappers. Uh, I know Dave is one, really getting some uh, some big notice. But Dave is you know, phenomenal. And he, he was really the standout moment of the Brits uh, you know, when he performed his song Black. Um, and following on, I guess, from Stormzy, who helped to popularise what we call grime, which is uh, a lot of British rap music. Um, sorry, Ralph, I couldn't hear you say again. No, no, Stormzy, indeed. I'm so glad you mentioned Stormzy because he is a phenomenon, a fantastic talent, and someone who has really uh, stimulated a lot of the development of British rap. Very interesting creatively. A very, very interesting creatively. I, I loved his album cover, like The Last Supper. You know, he... he He's a, he's a broad cultural thinker and, you know, and a gentleman and has, I think, really helped open the door for a lot of other British artists. Then you have artists like Hedy One, Jay Huss, also doing tremendously well. Uh, artists like H, 
But here, one thing we were talking about uh, in, in the industry yesterday night was um, it is quite male dominated, the grime area. And there, there's one fantastic artist called Little Sims uh, oh, on one of our independent labels uh, called AWOW, who, who, is, who is phenomenal. And I think she will break the US and will be a big name. Little Sim. So that's interesting. And of course, um, uh, the managers of uh, One Direction um, were also managing um, a, a female act, were they not? Oh, goodness, I am terrible on, on managers' rosters. So you've got me on that one, Ralph. Little Mix, uh, who, who had done well internationally. Oh, sorry, Little Mix. Well, Little Mix has been huge. Um, I'm mean, actually interested. I mean, obviously, they had success in the US. Um, you know, uh, clearly, you know, they, they're now, uh, the, the, the group members are different. Jesse Nelson has left, etc. So, you know, they're carrying on with their career in a slightly different form, as often happens with bands after a certain period of time. Uh, but, yeah, you know, the, the pop area, is one where we've had a lot of success, but it's perhaps a little bit quieter at the moment. And the, the difficulty we're experiencing is that British rap and grime doesn't really, or so far hasn't exported as much as other genres. Like our singer songwriters and our bands have translated really well into the US market, but maybe because we're competing with such incredibly strong American rap music, it's pretty hard to export rap music from the UK to the US. That is true. But um, if you look, for example, at uh, some established acts like Coldplay with their new album, uh, the... Uh, Music of the Sphere. Exactly correct. And uh, they've sold out six, six concerts next summer at Wembley Stadium. That's 90,000 per day for six days. Incredible. You can't get seats for that. But um, they are currently uh, in the charts in the UK with BTS with a song called My Universe. That's right. Well, you know, the collaborations, uh, sometimes I think, you know, something that helps keep a musical innovation going on. I'm really pleased that that's something that UK artists really seem to embrace. Uh, it's something we're always trying to get on the, on the Brit Awards, Ralph. We always want to bring some artists together in unusual ways. It's always harder than you think. So, Jeff, tell us about the Brit Awards because this is, I wouldn't say it's the equivalent of the Grammys. It's, I would think, in a sense, from a British perspective, even bigger globally. You, you go out globally with the television show for the Brits, do you not? So, so we very much like the Brits, you know, as much as possible to be a global brand that is a British window on music. So obviously, sometimes there'll be artists like, uh, let's say this year, um, you know, artists obviously who are dominating the charts are, Ed Sheeran and Adele, when you have artists like those, they translate very easily to an international audience. But it's right. also a platform that can help to promote artists who won't necessarily be known outside the UK to an international audience. So it's broadcast on free-to-air TV in the UK on ITV, but it's also streamed globally by YouTube. And uh, we're actually streaming both the nomination show and the main show uh, next time around. So the show's on February the 8th. We've already booked a lot of the lineup. I can't really talk about that, but it's going to be a massive show. Uh, and the nominations, again, we haven't announced the lineup, but that's uh, uh, just before Christmas on December 18th. And we're, we're really excited about those. It's a, it's a really important platform to build British artists and, and you know, bring them into the mainstream. So, Jeff, tell us about uh, just the significance of the Brit Awards to the British industry. Artists dream of being nominated December 18th, as you said, is the nomination date. But um, is there, a, is there a, a way that you can measure if someone does win a Brit Award, does that open up their careers, not just in the UK to a far greater degree, but globally, internationally? Yeah, I think, look, it very much depends. Sometimes the acts who are nominated or performing on the show, and it, it's very often the performers and winners, you know, obviously, who receive the biggest bounce uh, off the back of the show. But, you know, sometimes there are established names that, that are there to entertain the audience, maybe find some new fans, but they're already so well known that it doesn't make an enormous difference. I think the moments that we treasure the most are when there's an artist like Adele. Now, Adele, when she performed someone like you at the Brits, was not very well known. You know, it was almost a bit of a risky booking for the Brits because she wasn't a massive star at that point. Uh, but that song and her performance of that song on that night was so spellbinding 
that she silenced the whole arena, which is never easy to do, frankly, with a slightly drunken British crowd, uh, you know, never paying quite as much attention as they should, but she absolutely silenced everyone. And, you know, then became an absolute phenomenon almost overnight. And those are the, minute, those are the moments that we, we cherish the most. And uh, wasn't that also the case with Amy Winehouse when she first established herself and, and won uh, some Brit Awards with her incredible talent? That's absolutely right. And, you know, the, the, the great thing about Amy Winehouse and Adele is they both came out of the Brit School. So the Brit School is a, is a school that was set up by the BPI in 1991, 92. And we've had an incredible uh, range of artists. Uh, and, and in fact, not, not even just music artists come out of that school. So as well as, you know, Amy Winehouse and Adele and uh, more bands and other artists, Katie B, Katie Mellua, we go on to mention. Also actors and broadcasters. I mean, Tom Holland, the Spider-Man, uh, went to the Brit School. Uh, Kush Jumbo, the actress. Gemma Cairns, the broadcaster. You know, so there are a whole range of people now working across the creative industries in the UK and wider who went to the Brit School. And we're really ambitious to build on that. You know, we've got another school called Elam that we support in East London. And we like to actually extend it out of London as well because you know, they actually play a role in the talent pipeline for the industry and give opportunities to young people who could not afford to get a private education in music. So it's something we're, we're really passionate about and the Brits raises money for that. That's amazing. And um, so uh, clearly the RIAA could learn a lot from the BPI about, uh, about the Brit Awards and how it works because um, the Grammys are obviously uh, broadcast and streamcast in the United States, but don't have as wide a global footprint as the Brit Awards do. Well, we've worked, firstly, I, you know, I, I think the Grammys do an amazing job. It's a fantastic show and they you know, do, do a great job organizing it. Um, RAAA doesn't have the same relationship with the show as B, you know, BPI owns both the, the, the show and our charts, in fact, in the UK and, and another arts prize called the Mercury Prize. So that's really important to us as, as platforms to help promote our artists. Um, I think you know, the Grammys is a fantastic show and I think they do a lot of charity work and things like that as well. Um, I don't know that they're less international than the Brits. I think US artists obviously travel amazingly well internationally, but what we have really worked hard at is our digital strategy. And so as well as live streaming the show around the world on YouTube, you know, we are all over TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, etc you know twitter etc and that's where we get a huge amount of engagement particularly of young kids with the brit so jeff um just to try and give people a little more background about the bpi you champion the uk's recorded music community you safeguard the rights of its members and its artists you promote british music at home and abroad around the world and you have about 500 plus uh, independent and major labels, between them, 85% of the UK's legal consumption and number one in 10 global streams. So this is a big undertaking for you to superintend for the industry. Yeah, look, it keeps me out of mischief, Ralph, uh, most of the time. Um, the, the nice thing about the job is, is that it's got so many different bits to it. So we spend a lot of our time talking to government, and there's plenty going on with that at the minute. Uh, or we're fighting piracy. We lead most, you know, the work that the labels do, combating illegal streaming and streaming manipulation and uh, illegal downloading, etc. And we're kind of at the forefront of that. And then we're also, yeah, promoting British music in lots of different ways, including global trade, trying to help independent labels build their businesses as you know, a global success. And so we run trade missions around the world. We just had a, a sync seminar yesterday for Brazil. Uh, for UK labels uh, to help them you know, sync their music into the Brazilian market. Uh, and we run a scheme, a very important scheme, uh, called the Music Export Growth Scheme, which is gives grants to independent artists and independent labels to help them promote their music overseas. And that uh, you know, has been a tremendous success. About 300 artists have received grants of £5,000 to £50,000. And artists like Dave uh, and the 1975 have benefited from that and helped to increase their their international profile as a result. And that really makes a difference because it helps the indies compete with the majors, frankly, who have the resources to do that all around the world, whereas most independents don't. It's interesting just uh, talking about uh, 
the majors and certainly those independent artists that start independent like Adele did with Beggar's Banquet or actually XL Recordings. And now with her current single, Easy On Me, 238 million streams on Spotify in the first month, uh, broken all records, of course, uh, brilliant manager, Jonathan Dickens. But um, the, the, this whole idea of uh, streaming and the way that uh, streaming has spread internationally where uh, some of the big problems of 15, 20 years ago when piracy was really uh, reaching an arc, are you finding that this is now, because of streaming, become much less of an issue and it's much more about widening the reach of the talent? Uh, and British talent in particular? I, I would say that the balance has changed, Ralph. I mean, you know, back in the day when uh, I was seeing you, we were talking about this, you know, mid-end 20 years ago, it was the big issue. The big issue was the tsunami of illegal downloading uh, that was, you know, beginning to kill the industry. And, you know, we all rem remember Napster and everything that followed it and, you know, lawsuits with consumers and all that stuff. And I kind of did live through that then, and it felt that was the number one issue in the industry it was how on earth do we uh, protect and have still have some kind of market in the face of the digital transformation that was happening. And absolutely, streaming has turned that around entirely. I mean, I think you know uh, iTunes and everything before it helped, but now we have a fast-growing streaming economy. But piracy hasn't gone away; it's kind of changed. You have uh, you have uh, bots that are manipulating streams on streaming services. You have hack, cracked access to streaming apps and people getting access to Spotify Premium uh, or Apple Music for free. Uh, and then obviously you still have lots of peer-to-peer -peer sites and in particular stream ripping sites uh, that allow people just to you know, take a copy of a track and have a, have a permanent copy of it from a streaming service. And we're always trying to get the app stores to take those down. We bring lawsuits to get uh, sites blocked in the UK so that people can't access them. And that all helps to keep a lid on, on the illegal sites, make them less attractive and encourage people to go to Spotify, Apple Music or, or one of the other competing services. And um, uh, in terms of uh, the international markets, uh, uh, certainly in Britain, you've got a big uh, Indian speaking population and uh, uh, Pakistan population and many people from Europe, I think 5 million uh, Europeans that live in the UK in terms of foreign languages uh, and uh, particularly trying to compete against some of the other leading countries in the business like Sweden as an example that have had a great track record in building producing writing and so forth well this is where you know some of the things that are happening in the UK um, you know do make do give us a, a bit of concern um, we've obviously had you know a, a global pandemic which has prevented British artists from touring uh, for a long period and still it's very very difficult to tour even uh, even to nearby countries uh, and then we've had that compounded by brexit and the departure from the eu uh, which has meant that it's a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated for british artists to go overseas so you know we've always been very culturally open in the uk and it's just a concern that if we become more insular if our culture is less open to the influences that we've absorbed and the way we reflect those back to other countries will we continue to be as successful? So we're, we're very much talking to our government, trying to persuade the government that it's a priority to make it easier for British acts to tour. And we, we also want international acts to be able to come easily to the UK. And, and that kind of transfer of cultures is fundamental to, to our, our music. It is absolutely fundamental. Um, Jeff, here's a, a, an interesting question for you in terms of uh, Brexit and obviously the difficulty of touring. But uh, obviously, uh, uh, you encourage British, British acts to tour, as you've mentioned, uh, you stimulated with uh, trade, uh, uh, with uh, uh, international initiatives to develop the talent. And I want to get on to uh, this uh, interesting situation we have at the moment where the uh, success of British uh, music executives, particularly generations of music executives, where, for example, on a global level, you've got Rob Stringer running Sony, You've got Sir Lucian Grange uh, recently with a very successful IPO and doing extraordinarily well at uh, Universal and Max Lusada at the Warner Music Group. Um, and they basically are able to lead those companies all now uh, enhancing their value by many billions. Uh, uh, Warner Music, uh, just $10 billion increase in value just in the last uh, eight, uh, 10 weeks. And of course, uh, 
Now, so Lucian uh, managed to achieve uh, tremendous valuation at the IPO in, in Holland. Any thoughts on that? Well, look, you know, all those three guys, Max, Rob, and Lucien, they all sat on the BPI council, you know, back in the day when I was, when I was a young executive. And there is a culture about, I guess, taking risks, investing in talent, being brave, that they all share, uh, which I think has helped propel them to the heights that, you know, that they're, they're now at. And obviously, it's great for us to have, uh, you know, British executives that we know running the global companies. But equally, they're now global executives. And I think their British culture uh, is, st is still in them. But they're not going to do the UK favours just for the sake of it, just because they're Brits. Uh, they're only going to do it if it makes business sense. And, you know, that's why we need to be breaking talent and, and nurturing talent that has global potential. If you want those guys to, you know, to put their A and R budgets into the UK, so you know it is more competitive now than than ever before, and I think we really need to up our game, and we need more support from the government if we're going to stay, you know, a country that's the second biggest exporter of music in the world, and we're proud of that, but it's not a given. Incredible, just uh, less than one percent of the global population, and such tremendous exports, and of course in uh, Britain, is, would I be correct in saying that? The combined uh, indie and major labels spend around four hundred and fifty million dollars a year on A and R and A and R development. Two hundred and fifty million pounds. Yeah, that's right. It's about two hundred and fifty million pounds a year. Um, it's it's quite a high ratio. You know, we keep an eye on how much UK labels are spending compared to their international competitors. Generally speaking, the UK you know spend on A and R is a bit higher than most other territories, and we've also got a high marketing spend. And that's it. You've got to invest in the next wave of talent constantly. You can never rest on your laurels. And yeah, that's what we want to see. Um, Jeff, here's an interesting question from Darren Pearson, who's one of the uh, people that are in the room with you. And Darren says the following. Hi, Hi Jeff. Darren. How are labels ch changing their approaches to discovering new talent? Might you be able to list some of the typical activities you're doing in this regard, or more so during and after the COVID lockdown? Well, interesting. I mean, finding talent has changed out of all recognition, right? So, you know, it, it used to be uh, going to clubs and uh, finding bands that way and basically being out all the time as an A&R. Now, what people tend to say is, oh, it's all data driven. Everybody's just looking at play counts. Everybody's just looking at followers on social media. That's how talent's found. I, I think it's more than that. I think the data data is great if you want to follow data is less great if you want to innovate and lead and i think the best a and r's yes they are of course looking online and they're seeing what you know what people like and they're influenced by that but they're also trying to find talent that has something special and can connect with an audience uh, and that creates an emotional response in people uh, and, and that has something to say that's unique and original and so i think that the best a and r's are still doing that uh, and data is a tool that they use to help them find talent, but it's not the be all and the end all. Does that answer the question, Darren? Uh, Darren, I think that uh, that gives a pretty good idea about uh, the response to your question. Um, Jeff, we've got some interesting people that are actually uh, here um, um, on the chat and uh, watching uh, and listening with, uh, to you today. Uh, we have um, Zelda Mankiewicz. Zelda, welcome. Uh, we've got Steve Hutton. We've got Chopin Intasari. We've got Shelley Katz. I think we've mentioned Shelley's name. Uh, Richard Cobian, Randy Owen, Mort Dahlgren, we'd mentioned before. Uh, Louise Porter. Hi, Louise. Welcome. Um, Jay Katsuyama. Hi, Jay. Good to see you on the session. Glenn Friedman, who's a regular. Gillian Rose. Uh, we've even got Gennaro Castaldo. Gennaro. Buongiorno. Uh, him I know. Great to have you, Gennaro. Great to see you. Uh, Dominic Ostrovsky, Dick Huey, a good, great uh, professional. Uh, the great Deborah Newman. Debbie Newman, uh, welcome from New York City. Uh, Cass Hepburn, Cara Lipman, uh, Bradley Royds, and a great manager and publisher from Nashville, Barry Covert. Barry, and uh, of course, Alan Walmark, one of the great, great um, um, A&R thinkers and um, marketing professionals and somebody whose career goes back to the earlier days of Atlantic. So welcome to all of you. And um, just in terms of... Uh, I think I saw a, an old Warner Music friend, Howie Singer, as well on there at some point. 
So yeah, Howie, Howie. Howie's a, a wonderful, great uh, innovator and brought some of the great developments into uh, the business. And in fact, talking about these developments, Jeff, I wanted to get your view about this whole interesting, happy collision with music and esports. Because when the internet collided with the world of music and games, both industries had to evolve certain new kind of business models to meet the disruptive demands head on and to grasp the fresh opportunities that this new digital age, particularly because there are so many gamers, um, had uh, presented. Yeah, I'll happily comment on that. And I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat as we go and i've seen an interesting question about ai and an interesting question about tiktok uh, so we'll try and uh, morph into those as well so um esports really interesting area you know everybody's seen oh are you losing me ralph can you hear me still no no you're coming through great okay uh, so esports really interesting area everybody you know watch with interest what marshmallow did on fortnite and Drake's so, done interesting that. things and, you know, various, sorry? Do you, can you tell us a little bit about that, that Marshmallow, because that was really something on Fortnite for Marshmallow. Yeah, it was, it was really something. I'm, I'm really not the expert, but I seem to remember some of the people tuned in to watch Marshmallow live on, on Fortnite. And then it's had something like another 40, 50 million views uh, or more. Or thereafter, you know, uh, on cat audience. And I think all artists, you know, certainly in the UK, labels are thinking, how can we get, how can we partner with platforms like that, with gaming platforms, you know, with Twitch, uh, with uh, other games um, online to, to promote our artists and to help engage that younger audience. So it's something we're thinking about, even, you know, for the Brits, we're trying to activate partnerships like that. And I think esports has got some really interesting lessons for us, particularly around the freemium model, uh, in-app purchases, ways to sort of monetize content without necessarily creating a great barrier up front. And I think those are messages that, that those are lessons that we need to think about in the streaming context. So we've got one model, which is all the music available for a single price at a single time. You pay for everything up front and you've got everything. And I think there are lessons to learn that that's great and it's great to make everything available make it simple for a really affordable price but actually maybe there are things that we can do that will be innovative that some fans who are super fans will be will be really interested in and that they might be willing to pay for uh you know on top of their streaming subscription because you know the price of streaming has not moved in more than 10 years right and so in real terms it's fallen a lot we have to find ways to add more value into the streaming economy so, Jeff, the two uh, companies that uh, have really seen this interesting marriage between music and, uh, and uh, esports, one, of course, is Twitch, the Amazon company that gets uh, millions of people watching gaming. And the other company that uh, just announced uh, today uh, tremendous uh, profits, Roblox, and their yeah. metaverse, as they call them, that are also embracing music. They've got a great executive called John Vlasopoulos that... Um, uh, is a great uh, campaigner for blending the metaverse into the universe. Yeah, look, I, I don't consider myself an expert on the metaverse, but the coming together of all these different platforms, I about where the revenue comes from. You know, I think quite often there's a, a, a kind of fee agreed for a performance in those contexts rather than there necessarily being a, a kind of royalty or revenue share uh, off the back end. So I think the commercials have got a long way to go. Uh, and there are clearance issues that, you know, have, have far from being solved on all these platforms. I'm not sure Twitch is fully cleared yet around the world, at least. So I think there's a lot of uh, more work to do to develop these platforms as opportunities for artists and labels that will earn money. Part of it is promotional. But you know, we, it needs to be commercial, and um, I'd like to see more effort going into that. I think what the labels have been doing in terms of licensing other new opportunities, like Peloton, for example, you know, fitness oh, yes. apps, Calm, and, and mental health apps involving music. You know, we're seeing lots of new opportunities to integrate music into 
lifestyles in a way that can generate new revenue. So Jeffrey, there's a question from Shelley Katz who said, with the advent of AI-driven composition tools and full orchestral mock-ups, which provide stock music libraries with orchestral and ensemble music that is good enough for their target markets, what, what do you think the prospects are for live orchestral recordings in films and video games? Because that was always a great staple of the British music industry. Well, Abbey Road has done great business for, you know, for many years, having these big orchestral sessions. Um, this is something we're really giving quite a lot of thought to, and which I think is, you know, needs, needs a very nuanced approach from the industry. At the one end, you've got people who look at this and see it's a great opportunity. You know, we should always embrace technology. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to, to uh, to train AIs to create music that otherwise will never exist and that will be cheap to produce, that will be suitable for all kinds of uses potentially, and you know they can see the the opportunity. I think there are there are others who look at it and think, well, as a business, we're all about human creativity, and unless you create a framework that's going to incentivize humans to create, if they And I think we might have lost you, Jeff. He locked up again, didn't he? I think we might have lost him. But um, one of the questions that I would like to uh, ask Jeff, Jeff, you know? oh, good. You're back. Oh. Jeff, Jeff, what you might do is turn you your video off and just go audio. You've frozen for me, Ralph. Yeah, ah, I'll try that. We are. Yes, I think we've almost got you, Jeff. Okay, I can hear you, Ralph. Okay, well, here's a question for you, Jeff. I'm just looking at the uh, composition of the of the music that is being uh, consumed on streaming platforms like uh, Spotify. Is it would would it be correct in saying that some sixty to sixty five percent of streamed music tends to be catalog, and thirty five percent or so, or forty percent would be more contemporary? What what are you seeing from a streaming perspective? Yeah, that's that's pretty spot on. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that the the share that catalog represents is growing every year. Now, you know, there are different definitions of catalog, and so people have different stats they throw around. But broadly, you know, every year you're competing with a growing body of previous recorded music, right? So every year you're competing with another year's worth of catalog, uh, and that means I think it is getting more difficult for everyone to break new artists and you know maintain interest in them because we've got a whole history of recorded music to compete with. Um, now, in some ways, that's a great thing if you're EMI and you have you know the catalogue of all these incredible artists like Radiohead and Kate Bush and etc. and the Beatles, obviously, then that's money that you can invest into new talent. If you're a new label without without catalogue, streaming is a riskier business. Because we all know, you know, most investments into new artists don't pay off. If you don't have catalog revenues to rely on, then you know it, the risk profile is a lot higher. Which is why I guess there's so much money going into acquiring catalogs. In there. That's great, particularly publishing catalog. It's amazing. One thing which I wanted to ask you, Jeff, particularly the share that streaming companies take from a label and certainly from uh, the artists seems to be very high, you've got global corporations extracting value from streaming, global programming of playlists makes breaking acts more difficult. Give us some of your thoughts about uh, what we're going to do to try and let the artists really benefit to a greater degree. Well, now, now you're trying to drag me into controversial territory, Ralph, which, which is great. I welcome that. So whether it's being discussed uh, and something that is uh, something of an issue, obviously, the, uh, the managers of the artists fight uh, in the corner of the artist all the time, but just in terms of the share that uh, streaming companies take, it yeah. is, it's not low. It's not low. So, you know, the, the streaming companies are taking 30, maybe slightly more than 30% uh, of the retail. Um, and is that justified? Well, you know, I think it's pretty high. I mean, last time there was a, a negotiation between uh, certainly in major labels and the streaming companies, 
the streaming companies walked away with more, generally speaking. I think their share went up a bit. Um, right. They're arguing that they're not profitable, that they have huge investments in innovation uh, and in marketing to grow their user bases. I th think, you know, that's true, but the very in many cases, they, these are enormous tech corporations that are benefiting from music on their platforms in a whole variety of ways, including acquiring new customers in their ecosystems and garnishing huge amounts of data that are of great value. Whether or not the music community, including labels and artists and songwriters and publishers, are sharing fairly in that is, I think, an open question. And you know, I, th I think potentially it would be a great thing to see a bigger share of that coming back into music. I think that a lot of people would agree. I know Gillian Rose, who is a Brit that's watching this, uh, uh, seems to support that. And um, um, just want to ask you something further about some new talent. There's a British group called the Lathams, L-A-T-H-A-M-S, that have broken through. And um, um, uh, Joel Corey, who's also broken through uh, and been certified platinum in the US. Are you seeing any particular trends this year, Jeff, where... Uh, there's a particular style that seems to be gathering a momentum in the way that, say, BTS as a boy band outstripped all of the other boy bands of the last five to 10 years. But any particular um, uh, trend line you can see in terms of music, musical taste? I think we love my yeah, advice. I lost you a bit there, Ralph, but I, I heard you talking about boy bands. I mean, we're definitely not in a boy band moment. The UK has had a plenty of boy band periods, uh, and I'd say we're, we're uh, in my view, thankfully not in one of those uh, right now, but maybe it will come back. Um, you know, I think urban, urban music, you know, rap, hip hop is really the dominant genre in the charts. Um, you've got artists coming through all the time. I uh, like, you know, Tion Wayne, Central C, et cetera, at the moment, enjoying great success. Um, dance music also doing well. So Joel Corey mentioned uh, is doing very well. And KSI about esports. KSI is an artist with a huge following on gaming uh, who's doing fantastically and collaborating with new artists like Anne Marie. So I'd say it's quite mixed at the moment, both solo artists, and, well, mainly solo artists, but from different genres, dance a bit of electronic pop, etc. Where we're struggling still is rock music. And um, rock I guess you describe the late or sort of, I think they uh, as, uh, you know, kind of folky rock. But Jeff, rock is still very much buoyant. I saw that Iron Maiden with their new album Senjuku uh, did very well, got it into the top three uh, recently. And um, there are, uh, rock music is certainly not dead at all. No, but it's been hard breaking through uh, new rock bands. You know, I'd say the best, one of the best examples from the last few years would be the 1975. I don't know how they're doing in the US market, pretty well, I think, uh, but they're a, you know, absolutely fantastic, uh, creative rock band. And Wolf Alice as well, uh, also another independent artist um, who, you know, have released several verses uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, rock is far from dead, but it's not selling in the quantities that it was in the 90s, that's for sure. And I think a lot of us would. I know some somebody on the chat has spoken about Georgia Smith. Uh, I actually, I saw the late last night, Ralph, uh, and they were great. Georgia oh, Smith, really? wonderful artist. Wonderful yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she, she's a British artist, uh, and and you know she's she's done she's done tremendously well. Um, she's had some chart success. I think everyone's wait, waiting to see if her next album really. Uh, takes her up a level because she has all the potential in the world to be a global star. And she would fulfill this need for developing uh, more female acts coming through through the system. I know when she was originally signed to, was it AWOL, that then evolved into Platoon, uh, both uh, Denzel Fagelson, yes. and uh, he spotted uh, Georgia early on working closely with the management. And Denzel has always shown 
himself to be somebody that's pioneered uh, great new yeah. talent. He was one of the very early people on to um, uh, uh, Billie Eilish, but uh, certainly Georgia Smith and the way that she's evolved the style of hers uh, uh, really is representative of original British talent. That's absolutely true. Uh, I think she's a fantastic talent with a beautiful voice, and I think she will go on to greater things. But, you know, Louise saying on the chat, very few female acts coming through. Um, I think that is something that we're all watching and concerned about. And actually, the industry needs to get a grip on this issue. So we at the Brits and the BPI, um, we're looking, uh, we're doing some serious research into why is it that women are underrepresented right across the business um, and at every level of the charts. It's not just in the top 20 and the top 40. If you go down to the top 1,000, the top 3,000, you still find that there are almost twice as many men as women uh, active as recording artists and enjoying, enjoying success. We want to understand what are the drivers behind that. I think some of those factors, but some of them are social factors as well. You know, the pressure that's put on uh, women in terms of uh, their appearance, um, are they getting as much support to pursue creative careers at schools? But it's also about, do we have enough female NR executives? Are there enough uh, senior uh, female executives in the industry? And is the climate in which they try to pursue a career as a recording artist supportive one? So we are researching that and we want to get to the bottom of those problems and try and encourage more young women to become artists. Well, that's a that's a great and point. To pursue a, a long career as artist. Exactly. That's a, that is a really great point. And in fact, Louise Porter has just said that she appreciates what you've said. She says there's some incredible British singers out there, such as Yasmin MB, M uh, for Mother, B for Bertie, who's amazing, a young singer, songwriter, producer. But Jeff, uh, really uh, such a pertinent uh, observation and just so great that the BPI uh, deals with uh, things uh, in such a, such a constructive uh, developmental way, which is uh, something that um, uh, is re really stands out uh, globally. And maybe that's one of the uh, pieces of secret sauce that drives the success of the British creativity and music industry around the world. Well, look, I, I hope so. You know, I think most people who work at the BPI, I think all of them, they're people who are passionate music fans who want to help artists succeed, want to help labels succeed. And, and, you know, you're always looking for what you can do that will help, whether it's giving grants to indies or putting on a better Mercury Prize to promote uh, artists to the public or making sure that we've got an industry that's not just, just diverse, but also sustainable. You know, frankly, we've got a lot of work to do on climate change as an industry that we're not really talking about enough and haven't got a clear enough plan on. And I think it's the responsibility of organizations like the BPI to sort of push these issues and, and try and get the industry together to act. Absolutely right. Well, I'm afraid that we, uh, we're not beaten by the challenges, we're beaten a little bit by the clock. Uh, Tom, uh, if I can bring you in, uh, we are just about uh, running out of time, but we've, uh, we've had a fantastic session with you, Jeff. This has been really great for somebody who started his career singing backing vocals for Paul McCartney at Abbey Road Studios. <laughs> My goodness, what an extraordinary career you've had and the way that you're driving this uh, important global industry in the way that you have. Tom, over to you. Thank you, Ralph. Hey, one thing you glossed over, Jeff, uh, one more little nugget from your early days as a choral uh, master. Oh, Tell God. us, you, you performed at an iconic event. Can you share what that was? I, I think, thought this was just between us, Tom. Um, <laughs> well, in, in the spirit then of, of abandoning all dignity. <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously, I, I, I was... I, I was a chorister at St. Paul's Cathedral. So we had the services that came along to the cathedral. So my last service was, was uh, Charles and Diana's wedding, where I was the head chorister, you know, carrying the cross in front of all those people, uh, which maybe means that nothing can embarrass me anymore. I don't know. But that was, that was quite, quite an amazing experience because the country went obviously crazy. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a pretty interesting time in the UK when Things weren't that great, and I think it was a moment in time where suddenly the, the country had something to celebrate, and so it was huge news. But um, that that got me used to working under pressure a little bit. 
Well, th this event is very intentionally called Who Knew the Smartest People in the Room? And there's the greatest <laughs> who knew of all right there. Wow. Who knew that you did that? That is remarkable. And as the smartest people in the room, it is clear who those two are today, you and Ralph. Ralph, you are always mesmerizing in the host seat. So thank you very much for, again, delivering thank you, Ralph. In, in spades. And Jeff, this has been amazing. And, and frankly, there have been a lot of lessons learned for the, your U.S. counterparts here. So thank you for talking about what you've done to drive success on behalf of British artists globally. Remarkable job. Um, well, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. And thanks to everyone on the chat. I wish I could have picked up on, on more things, but it, it was a real pleasure to be invited. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ralph. Well, thank you. And to the audience, thank you for your continued patronage. We will be back here on Tuesday. We have two more programs right. this year, next Tuesday and next Thursday. And you're in for two more treats. So with that, I'm going to sign off with my customary parting shot, and that is get a shot and be nice to each other. Take care, folks. Thanks very much. Bye.